This is the game of life. Created in 1917 by mathematician John Conway, the whole game is an infinite grid with cells on it that could be either alive or dead, and the rules are simple. Any cell that has two or three living neighbors live, otherwise, dies. Now, once you set the initial baron and started the game, these cells go on generation after generation, obeying the rules until it reaches a final state, a final baron. Some initial barons reach a constant baron and stick to it forever. Some are stuck in an infinite loop, some destroy themselves, and some keep growing forever. Some people went far to create a live organism simulation within the game of life. They just created life in life. While some others created a 3D version of the game that produced these amazing organic-like living structures. It is just mind-blowing how these simple cells with simple rules are capable on the collective level of producing such a complex behavior. But the most shocking fact about the game of life is that you can never predict the fate of the Baron just by looking at its initial generation. Believe it or not, even the most powerful computers in the world, given all the time in the world, cannot predict the fate of the Baron. Yes, the game follows an algorithm, but still, you just can't. The game of life is just unpredictable. It is undecidable. It is just non-computable. But doesn't that remind me of something? This is a brain map. Well, nearly. I mean, the brain map was not created yet now, but it will in the future, hopefully. An interactive brain 3D map features neurons and their connections of the brain, and the rules are simple. The dendrites receive either an excitatory or an inhibitory neural signal, something like the zeros and ones in the transistors in your computer processor. And the accent sends the result to the next neuron. And by repeating this process over and over, with few changes being made with each neuron, the ultimate result will be, well, you know. It is just mind-blowing how these simple cells with simple rules capable on the collective level of producing such complex behaviors. The problem is, some people assume, just like the game of life, it seems that we can never predict human behavior just by looking inside the brain. And at least, for now, their opinion seems correct. It seems that, as some scientists say, consciousness is non-computable. And the question now is, why? comprehensible thing about this universe is that it's all comprehensible. Albert Einstein said this, expressing his wonder of the spectacular power of the human brain. A power that until this day we still consider as one of the ultimate questions and hardest challenges of humanity. And in an attempt to answer this question, scientists started to use the conventional, typical way of uh, understanding complicated systems. That is, break it down to its fundamental components. But after decades and decades of scientific effort, we're still unable to understand how these seemingly simple neurons on the collective level, capable of producing consciousness, or as Michio Kaku put it, this led some scientists to rethink the method used to study the brain, saying there must be something wrong with our methodology. They start to think differently, producing so many bizarre ways to explain consciousness, but one seemingly reasonable approach stands out. Instead of asking ourselves 
big questions like uh, what is consciousness? We should ask ourselves small detail-oriented questions like what are the phenomena that consist consciousness? For instance, how does memory work or how does language affect our awareness and thinking? But most importantly, how do we think? I mean, how do our brains go about solving problems? Think about it. Brains originally developed by natural selection to solve problems so that it increases the chances of survival for the organism. Many said that our brains evolved uh, to use algorithms to solve problems, but for some this wasn't the case. For some, the brain, partially of course, does not follow an algorithm, and its outcomes are well, non-computable, meaning that we cannot predict the output of your thinking, of your behavior, just by looking at its input. We know that consciousness probably produced in the brain, and we know that the brain consists of neurons, and we know that nothing about the neurons, neither about the connections between them, the synapses, is non-computable. In other words, for the consciousness to be non-computable, there has to be a part of it works that isn't governed by the classical laws of physics, a part that we don't yet know about. Oh, I know what you think about right now. In the 1980s, the BBC made an interview with the father of AI, American cognitive and computer scientist Marvin Minsky, in which he expressed his opinion on the issue, saying, the human brain is just a computer made of meat, compelling one of the most famous and great minds of mathematics and physics to start a distract about the issue. Yeah, that's right, uh, Roger Penrose. By writing the, his book, The Emperor's New Mind, Sir Roger Penrose proposed a controversial theory that assumes quantum mechanics plays a role in the decision-making process in the brain. Now, just like the Turing machine and the game of life, quantum mechanics has its own version of the non-computability. According to quantum mechanics, subatomic particles can exist in many places at the same time as a wave of probability, known as the wave function, which suddenly collapses once interacting with an external system of particles. And what will be the properties of the particle after the wave function collapse? Well, no one can predict. Not until we see them. It's, in other words, it is just non-computable. Moreover, this was thought to be the only way wave function could collapse. But according to Roger Penrose, wave function could actually undergo another kind of collapse, a one which he calls objective reduction, or or. Penrose proposed that the wave function is an actual physical wave in which, uh, to be attained, the particle has to remain excited. And since physics tells us that all particles in the universe seek the state of the least excitement, systems of the quantum particles will objectively undergo a wave function collapse even without any interaction with an external system. In the Emperor's New Mind, Pinoz hypothesized that such a process might happen somewhere in the brain, which according to him can explain the non-computability of the human behavior. But exactly where could that happen? Well, after publishing his book, an anesthesiologist and professor at the University of Arizona, Stuart Himroff, wrote to him saying, it seems that you don't know about the microtubules. Now, the microtubules are a pipe-like structures in the neurons, in fact in any cell, that play in a supportive role in the cellular functionality. But Penrose and Hemrove assumed that those structures are capable of hosting a quantum event like the OR, which means that the previously believed to be kind of trivial or mysterious structures are actually behind the proposed non-computability of the human behavior. Now, since this theory came to light and it's being criticized by so many people who think that it's just a nonsense, I mean, it has been criticized by philosophers, mathematicians, physicists, neuroscientists, computer scientists, you name them. The most famous criticism claims that the brain is too warm, wet, and noisy to host a quantum event. But this argument kind of started to crumble when we discovered that quantum events are hosted 
by a lot of biological systems. The eye of the European robin bird and the leaves of the well plants. In fact, it has been proven that in some cases the warm environment could be better at hosting quantum events. Some criticize the mathematical and the physical foundation of the theory, while others require a more empirical evidence of the theory. Now, in 2017, Steve Paulson went far to describe Penrose as a maverick in the field of science. No one can quite know what to make with this theory, but conventional wisdom goes something like this. Their theory is almost certainly wrong, but Penrose is a brilliant, one of the very few people I have met in my life who without a reservation I call genius, physicist Lee Smullen said. I hope I pronounce his name right. And here we are, knowing absolutely not so much about the brain so that we can adopt or debunk this theory. A theory of a force obsolete in between the forces of nature, an attribute of it that stands in the shadows behind our best and worst, for it is the one who decides the state of the subatomic particle after the collapse of its wave function in its seek for the least excitement state, the least energy level, and by deciding the particle's state, perchance deciding the chain of actions to follow, amplified and orchestrated by the microtubules, leads to the final decision making in our brains, and most importantly, an attribute of nature responsible for our creativity. Creativity, which allowed Penrose to come up with the theory of the orchestrated objective reductionism, or orc or. And until we can confidently approve or debunk this theory, never stop thinking. Always keep thinking. See you in the next one.